Hi everyone. Uh, today we are going to be speaking about modules, imports, and command line arguments. So we're not going to do a notebook for this because it doesn't make much sense to use a notebook while doing these things. So first I'll have a bit of a presentation describing all these different aspects. And once we've finished with that, we will make a program that uses all of these aspects. Uh, before I start that, I was wondering whether you'd like me to go over the assignments. Uh, David, could we get a poll for this? Okay, so maybe just in the chat, just yes or no. Uh, there are not too many of us, so it should be possible to see. Okay, so looking like a yes. Some no's. Uh, okay, so I mean, it's about 50 50 from what I can see. So I'll just go over the completed assignment and I'm going to do it fairly quickly. So it's just going to take a couple of minutes and then we can get back to the lecture. So I'm just going to go to where I have the assignments. And we can just go through basically what's happening. Uh, so the first assignment, the first section was fairly simple. Um, it was mainly just checking what the different operations can be with mathematical types and getting started with prints and seeing the types of things. So in order to check all these types, you're just using the standard operation. Uh, what happens often is I use that notation over here to specify the power and uh, some people use that over here and this is a different operation it's called the bit shift operation so this does not put 16 to the power of 5 so to do power it's double asterisk and always look at your output because if you look at the output of 16 shift 5 it won't be in the right order of magnitude um, this next question was fairly simple. I mean, you just needed to fill in all of these. This was put here mainly just to show the assert statements and so that you can learn to get input. So this, if you put all the correct uh, operations in and save them in the correct variables, this will print all the assert checks as fast. Uh, question three was where it started to get a little bit more complicated. So over here, we want to get input. Uh, in the question, I've said that you can tell that this is going to always be the correct input at this stage. So you can just instantly hard cast this to an int. So by putting it in the int method uh, or function, it will convert the string into an integer. And then the way I do this is I save the expressions into variables so that your if statements become easier to read. So you can go if less than 14 instead of having the actual. Uh, expression. In this case, it doesn't make much difference, but when your expressions become more complicated, it's sometimes easier to name your expressions than to have the expression in the if statement. So this just got the input checked if it was less than 14 and then printed if it's less than 14 or not. The next question that we did is we were adding an extra check to see whether the number was a multiple of 11. The way we do that check is we need to add whether the mod of the number uh, returns zero, which means that it is a multiple of 11. Otherwise, it will not be. And then once again, save these into the variables and then it makes it easier. So if the numbers are multiple of 11 and less than 14, that's the output and so on and so on. So this just builds the if else tree. And then at this stage, I did something different. So often, these trees can become very big and very hard to follow when you're looking at them. And it's much easier to just use some mappings. So what we do is we use a dictionary and then you just need to define what these two values are in the tuple. So this, I think the first one was a multiple of 11. The second one was less than 14. So what we then can do is just take create these two variables that hold our expressions and then just feed those two into this mappings as a tuple and it will return the result. So this is a lot more compact than this if else tree. 
So this is quite, in my opinion, uh, this is much easier to follow what's going on than this. And then the final question was to see whether the, oh, to add a check to see if this was actually an integer. And the easiest way to do this in Python is to wrap this in a try and accept. Um, the other way is to use string checks to see if it's a digit and things like that. The problem with that approach is Python's checking for that isn't the greatest. So negative numbers aren't treated as digits. So you have to first remove the negative sign. So this is a much more compact version. So we first try and convert the input into an integer. Uh, if that work, if that doesn't work, we print that this was invalid. And if it does work using the else, we then run our standard code for printing the output. So question four was looping. So this was uh, an introduction to how to start thinking about looping. So generally one way to think about looping is you will have one for loop for every dimension in your data. So in this case, we're trying to make a two dimensional uh, shape. So we're gonna need two for loops. And then the complexity of these went up as the question. So the first thing, just printing asterisks, this is just so you can check that your loops are working correctly. And then the rest are just to see how the different loops function. So how the inner loop will affect the indices, how the outer loop will affect the indices, and then how to calculate the index for like in order using both of the row and column index. So this first rectangle example is easy. We could just take the square example and change the inner loop to the width variable. And that would have given us the right output. So the N is the length, the M is the width, and print the star. In the row index, we will use the outer variable to print that. In the other case, we will use the inner variable and then to get the cumulative index, it's just the length of the rows multiplied by which row we on plus which column we on. So that's a fairly standard formula when you're doing these sorts of operations. The next example was printing a triangle. So this basically is more, it's quite a bit more complicated than the previous example, but all we have to do is iterate over all of our rows but then what changes is how wide our columns are and the columns corresponds to which row we on. So we use which row we on to say how many columns we should print. And we need to add one to that because otherwise this starts at zero and range zero won't happen. So it won't print the first row. So we just need to increment this by one. Then um, in terms of printing the row and index values, that's the same thing where we're just printing J or I. And finally, for the cumulative index, you can either use this formula, which involves a bit of math, or else alternatively, we could have just put a counter in and then just incremented this counter every time we've added a new number. So this would do the same thing. It's just we need an extra variable to do this, which Sometimes it's easier, sometimes isn't. So it's situational as to whether you'll do something like that. And then the last case was flipping this around. Um, this was also more difficult than the previous one. So for this, we needed to start from our outer loop stayed the same, but our inner loop, we needed to flip around. So if you just subtract the total that we wanted minus J, that's gonna flip it around. After doing that, printing the row and column indexes is simple, but calculating the cumulative index is more complicated. I'm not gonna go into this formula. Basically, I've explained it in the notebook here, where you split it into a rectangle and a triangle to calculate what the offsets are. There are other ways of doing this. Um, in this case, just using a counter would probably be easier than doing this formula. Uh, then this question for prime numbers, a lot of people get stuck on this range that I have. Um, so the reason that this is like this is you only need to check up to the halfway point when you're calculating a prime because at halfway, you're going to have two 
and anything after that is going to be a value between two and one. So it's not possible to have a prime number above the halfway mark. So this is just an optimization. So we can cut the number of comparisons that we have to do in half. And then all that we do here is we check whether the number is divisible. And if it is, we set it to false. Otherwise, we continue. Um, something else we can do here is we can actually break out of this loop early. Uh, I didn't do this correctly in this answer. So if we added a break, yeah, that would be another optimization. And then we set prime to be true at the start. And the only time prime is going to be set to false is if these numbers are divisible by each other. So if it goes through all the numbers and prime is still true, we can append that number to prime. And then this is just a more compact representation. So the only time this else statement is going to be executed is if this doesn't break. And so as long as all the numbers were non-divisible, it won't break out of the inner loop and it'll append that number. And then this was just to get you started on GitHub. And I mean, if you follow these instructions, it's fairly simple to set that up. Okay, any questions on this? Okay, so I am gonna go through assignment two quickly because I mean, that was on Tuesday. Stu, so this was quite a bit more complicated than the first assignment. Um, so in terms of checking whether these are valid, there are lots of ways of doing this. Um, I did this as it's an easy way to understand what's going on. So I just made a character set that contains all the characters that I'm looking for. And what happens is when a sequence comes in, we go through each character in the sequence one at a time. We check whether the character is not in the character set. If it's not in the character set, we return false. And if it gets through all the characters and they're in the character set, we can then just return true. So that's fairly simple. This just goes through each character in the sequence and checks that it's one of our valid characters. The next question was to do the reverse complement. So what I did for this is I just created a mapping. So A goes to T, T goes to A, C goes to G, G goes to C. The other ways of doing this, um, there's a more compact way that I've seen people do this, but it's slightly more advanced in terms of the functions that you're using. So all that we do in this is we make an empty string that we're going to store a result. We then go through the string backwards because we're reversing it. And then we just take every character, the uppercase version of it, and plug it into our mapping so that we add um, that character, the reverse complemented or the complement character to our sequence. I just added this in so that the case is maintained. You don't actually need this. We could have just said at this stage, um, if we just went results plus equals to the mapping, it would have worked. It's just that then a lowercase sequence would have been converted to an uppercase sequence. What this does is it checks whether the character is lowercase, and if it is, it just converts it back to being lowercase. So this would allow you to maintain mixed case if that was something you wanted to do. Uh, and then finally, this question was just going to loop and accept input until nothing was input. And if it was a valid sequence, it would reverse complement the sequence. Otherwise, it would print invalid sequence. So We've already created all the logic for doing our reverse complements. Now we just need to wrap that logic in a loop that repeats. So we use a while true to make sure that this is run at least once. Our input prompts the user to enter a sequence. We then check that the sequence has some content. So if the person enters a blank string or an empty string, it, this will return true and it'll break out of our while loop. If Otherwise, some input has been entered. The first thing we do is we check whether the input is valid. So this returns true and false. So we can use this as our if condition. So if it's a valid input, print the reverse complement of the input. If it's not valid input, print invalid sequence. So this will um, do the reverse complement. So this example I have here is an example of mixed casing. So we've got uppercase G, lowercase T, uppercase A, lowercase T. So the casings maintained when I did this um, check over here in my loop. 
Then in terms of doing a C as a cipher, once again, this is, there are many ways of doing this. Uh, one way is to use a dictionary, the other way is to use a bit of math. Uh, I did both. So in this case, what I did was the order function returns the numerical value and the numerical value, each character goes up by one in that order. So A will be 80 something, I think, and then 87 will be B, 88 and so on in that sense. So this is then a long expression. So the first thing we do is we get the, take the uppercase character from our message and get what that value is. We then add whatever shift we need to that value and we subtract the starting character A to normalize this to be from zero to 25. Once we've done that, we add the offset back to this so that it goes back into the correct um, numerical space for the characters. So if this was two coming out of here, we'd add A's order to that and we'd get C coming back. And this is just a list comprehension that goes through each character and applies the mapping. And this just joins that back into a string. So this just converts the list into a string using nothing to join the different characters together. So this is one way of doing it. Uh, the other way of doing it is we can make a dictionary that rotates the characters. So the way of doing this would be to firstly generate our character set. So string has a variable in it called ASCII uppercase, which is all the ASCII characters. Alternatively, you could have just set these manually to A, B, C, D, and so on. And then our encode string is gonna make a new dictionary that is rotated. So we're gonna go through each character in our character set, so A, B, C, D, and we are then going to look at that character set and extract the shifted value from it. Mod 26 is just gonna rotate around in case we go above the end. So if we were on Y and we wanted to rotate by five, it's gonna go Z and then wrap around back to the beginning. So modding will always create, um, when you're looking at indices, it'll always wrap back to the start if you mod by the length of your dictionary. I could have also, instead of hard coding this as 26, we could have gone Ling char set, which is actually a better way of coding. It's very bad practice to have hard coded values. It's better to have either Ling char set or to define a constant up here and use the constant in your expression. The reason that it's bad practice is once your code becomes more, uh, your code base becomes larger, it becomes much more complicated to find where you've set these values. Whereas if you've set constants at the top of your script, it's easy to update them later on when you need to come back. So this just creates another lookup dictionary where each character will map to the rotated character. And we then just go through the message, plug the character into our rotation mapping and the rotated character will come back. And then finally, decoding, you can either do the opposite of this. So instead of adding a shift over here, we subtract the shift and it'll create that. Otherwise, what we can actually do is just make use of our initial encoding, but give the negative shift. So this will reverse the shift and decode an encoded message. All right, so that's the purpose of this question was basically to use dictionaries and to create lookup tables and then to iterate over something and apply a new mapping to the existing sequence. And finally, these questions were to test how to get indices when you are working with um, pre-generated lists. So in the previous homework, you had to actually generate the list from scratch. In this case, we already have our structure. We want to go into that structure and update values. So the goal of this was to kind of figure out how indexing works so that you have a better idea of how to index uh, multi-dimensional structures. So 3.1, we wanted to print this structure where there were just X's on the outside and O's on the inside. So the way we can do this is by setting everything to O. We then iterate over each of the rows. We then iterate over each of the columns. And 
if we're on the first row or the last row, set it to X. And if we're in the first column, so that's I is equal to zero, or the last column, I is equal to N minus one, then set it to X. So N minus one, our indexing starts from zero. So we've got zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So it's always one less than what the value would be. So that's why we have to subtract the one. And then we can use list comprehensions to do the same thing. So we are setting it to X if our condition passes, otherwise we're setting it to zero. And this is sometimes an easier approach, sometimes it's more complicated. Uh, there also could be a more compact representation to do this. Uh, that's not what was important for this question. So the next question we wanted to make an X and this actually varies depending on the size. So if it's an even number, we'll have four in the middle and if it's not, we'll have a single character. And this was just if J is equal to I is easy because J is equal to I across the diagonal. But then the other case on the inverse is we just needed to inverse our index. So take how wide it is minus one to get it to be on the ninth column and then subtract I so that as I is going up, we're actually going backwards one. And then this is the same as previously. We're just giving it a more compact representation as a list comprehension. Um, okay, so this example was, there are lots of ways of solving this. The easiest is to see whether you are this, the cumulative index from the previous homework is odd or even. And using that, we can then set whether this checkerboard pattern is a zero or an X. So all we do is we add them together and mod by two. So by adding them together, we are going to say whether, oh wait, so this isn't quite the previous homework. So we just add the indexes together and it, this will be zero, one, two, three, four. So this will be starting on an even, then an odd, then an even, then an odd, and then the columns will be alternating that across. So that will give you, by adding them together, you're gonna to get your checkerboard pattern. And this being one or zero is just gonna be, if I made this X and that zero, it's just gonna flip the order around. Um, yeah, so this is just a more compact representation using list comprehension. And then this question was the hardest one of all of them. There are lots of ways of solving this. Uh, so this actually involves some math to solve, which is also makes things a little bit more complicated. The way I solve this is I find the centermost coordinate to normalize my X to treat this as being zero, zero. Otherwise, this corner over here is gonna be zero, zero. And once we've done that, you can just use the straight line formula to see whether this, these values fall to the right or to the left of this line. And a way you can see how that works is if we turn all of these, set these to one. Uh, and run this. This formula here, y is less than negative offset of x is giving us this diagonal over here. So we're seeing whether these values fall under this diagonal or above that diagonal and setting them to X accordingly. And then each of these just is another different line. And then if all of them pass, it means that it falls within the diamond. And if you've done some linear algebra, you can do the same thing here by rotating the coordinate space. So that's more math. Uh, there isn't really a non-mathematical way of solving this, but it is just a fun problem to solve. So I've gone through these assignments very quickly. Um, if you have more questions on them, please ask them in the Stack Overflow and I'll give more detailed explanations of what's actually going on with the code. But for now, let's get going with the lecture. So I'm just gonna go back to ITP. And to start, we're not gonna do anything in uh, visual code. All right, so for today, we're gonna to discuss imports, modules, and command line arguments. Uh, imports are used fairly commonly. Most scripts will have at least one import. And what imports do when you are using them is they allow you to split your code into different files, which is very useful. Another use is when you're using packages created by other people, you will be importing their packages. 
some examples that we've done so far is importing pretty prints. We've imported default dict. So those are all imports. So we're importing some functionality from a different file into our current files. There are two ways that you can import functions. Uh, these two keywords are import and from. They serve slightly different purposes. And finally, there is an as keyword which allows you to rename your import. So the first case is just using import and the package name. What this will do is it will import all the functionality from the package. Sometimes this is useful, sometimes it's not useful. If you're using a package like bio Python, it is massive and the import takes a couple of seconds. So it slows your program down. So it's not always viable to import everything. So in those cases, we use this from the package import syntax. So this allows us to import certain functions from a larger package. So we would go from the package import some function. So in, let's think of an example, we could go from collections import default dict. So collections is the package, default dict is the function or class that we would like to import. So the as keyword is just a keyword that allows you to rename. So there are a bunch, most of the commonly used Python packages have got short names. So NumPy, which is numerical Python, is often named N NP to make it shorter when you're using its functions. Uh, yeah, so if you want to use the from keyword, you do need to know the function name. When you're using VS Code, if you it does have completion, so it'll give you a list of possible functions from the package. So that's very useful. Uh, so as there are two purposes for as. So one thing is if we are importing a package that has got similar names to what we are already using, as allows us to give it a different namespace so that it's not going to conflict with our current function names. And the other is just creating shorthand. So if you have a very long package name, it allows you to rename it something much shorter to make it easier to write your code. Uh, the next thing is from. Um, you can also import multiple packages with from by comma separating. Uh, so from package import function one comma function two. You, I don't think you can rename these using as. I've never tried, so I don't actually know the answer to that. But if you're just importing a single function, you can also use the as to rename that function. So that's how you import. Another extension of imports are modules. So what a module is, it's a way of grouping all your code together so that you have a single package. So earlier I've spoken about from packages importing functions. This is how you structure a package. Uh, one of the benefits from this is you can import all your functionality. So in my example on the right, I'll go through in a bit more detail. We could just say import source and it'll import all of our functions in this package. The caveat to doing this is that we need to be in this package name directory to do that. Uh, you can package this as an actual package and install it, but that's a bit out of scope of what we're doing here. So if you want to do something like that, you can follow these instructions and it'll tell you how to make your own packages. I think this also covers how to put your packages onto PyPy, uh, which is an online repository of packages. So then it makes it much easier for other people to use your packages as they can just go pip install your package name and it will install this package onto their computer. So our current, the structure of one of these is you would basically have your package name, which is your project folder. So this is the highest level of your project. Setup.py is a file that's required for creating packages. Uh, to run this as a module, you don't actually need setup.py. I just added it here so that you know where this has to be if you do want to make packages. Then you can either have this outer level be your module name, or you can have it be source. I always just use source to make it easier to understand what source and tests, which is something I can't cover now, but you can create tests that test all your code in a separate folder called test, and it will read everything in from source to do that. Uh, for Python to recognize a folder as a module, you need to have a blank init.py file. So this file doesn't have anything in it and generally it won't have anything in it. 
there are cases where you can put things that basically set up namespaces. Uh, I've never had to do that. So I'm sure you probably won't encounter those situations. And then inside our source, we would have our module name. So this is what we want to call our module. And inside, yeah, we will have all our code. So what's common is to have a command line interface. That'll always be in your module name level. So directly in module name, you'll have CLI.py. And this will often be what's called the entry point to your program. So this is the script that's run. And this script is in charge of calling all these other processes. So this is the first script that your program will run. Once again, we need this init.py to let Python know that this is a, a module. We then have all of these folders, which can be used to group different functionalities of our program. So make it much easier to understand the structure of our program if we try and separate everything logically. So in this case, we have got a data loader, which will be loading our data. So often what I like to do when you're working with data sets and someone else is going to get your project, make your data available online. And this loader will be able to, will have all the functionality to download the data from the online data source. So this just makes it much easier for you to share your code with other people. Pre-processing in this example could be once you've loaded your data, this is just going to clean up the raw data. That's another thing. Whenever you're putting your data online, always put the raw form online and give them the functionality to pre-process because often you lose information when you, uh, filter and do sort of certain operations. So it's always best to start from the raw form and then build up into a more refined form. And finally, we could have some visualization, which would have all our visualization functions and things like that. So this is just in the last lecture, we'll go more into detail about actually making a package and a workflow where you start in Jupyter Notebook and slowly move your code into a package. So it's just good to know these are what modules are. Something else that modules use is called relative imports. So this is instead of just going import data loader, you have to give the relative path to the package. So in this case, source is the lowest level of the package. So it would be source dot module name to go into this level dot data loader would go into this level and then dot loader would load this file. So Regardless of which file you're in in your package, you can always you always start your imports from the roots of the package. The only thing that happens when you do this is, is if you try to run one of these scripts as a standalone script, this won't work anymore because relative importing is specific for modules. So to run your program once you've done this, you need to then use the module flag. So this tells Python that instead of running this script as a standalone Python script, we want to run this as a module. And to run this, we would need to once again be in the package name directory. And then we're saying Python, run this as a module, and then the entry point to our program. So as I said earlier, CLI is often the entry point. So this will look in the source smart package in our module and run this script inside the package. So modules are very useful because they allow you to package your code well. If you create the module while you're developing your code or doing your data analysis, it makes it much easier than getting to the end of the project and trying to create it once all your code's finalized. So I would recommend you to build this as you're going. Um, so these modules, this is, on, so you get different modules. So when you're using pandas or numpy, which are other packages, they're on the internet. But when you install them, they'll be installed to your local computer. What I'm speaking about here is setting up your own module. So this would be on your computer. It wouldn't necessarily be on the internet. So if we were going to create a project, which as I said, we'll do in the last lecture, you will create this structure on, as your project folder and you will set these things up as you're going. And then eventually you can move this onto the internet once it's working. Uh, so generally 
when you're coding most things and when you are creating your own packages, that's always going to be on your computer that you're working with. It's not going to be on the internet yet. You can use the internet to back up your code, but you won't be making changes to that code on the internet and not on your local computer. So this was touched upon in a previous lecture, but I just want to go over it again. So basically, this is how a Python script should be structured. We haven't spoken about doc strings, but what doc strings are is they are triple quoted strings in certain places within a file. So either the first line of the file or the first line of a function. And what these allow you to do is you can use other programs to make documentation for your code. So that will actually go through all of your scripts and extract these strings and make a web page out of them that allows users to work with your uh, package and see the documentation. So what this is called is self-documenting code. And it's very useful because creating documentation is a nightmare. While doing this, while you're writing your code, once you finish creating your program, you already have all the functionality to build your own documentation. Okay, yeah, Toby was just answering a question there. So the first thing you're gonna have in your file is your file doc string. This will generally be a high level overview of what this file does. It will also contain any copyright information for your program. It'll also generally contain the name and the date. Uh, so the name of the author of this, the date, and you'd also maybe put your GitHub handle or something in here. So self plug yourself when you're making code so that people who are reading the code can see who made it. Always a good idea. Uh, the next part of a Python script will be your imports. So the reason you always want to have these at the top and not floating around is when you're using someone else's package and things aren't working, you first go and look at the top of their script to see that you have all the packages installed. If you put this in the middle of your code somewhere, it becomes very hard to figure out, oh, this isn't working because I haven't installed this package from the internet. So always put your imports at the top of your script. And then I touched on this earlier, your constants are always defined at the top. So once again, these are all the values that might change. So for now, a constant of 100 might make sense. But when we're doing something later on, this might need to be 150. So if you put 150 in your code everywhere, you're going to have to go manually find all these 150s and change them. Whereas if you used to find a constant at the top, you just need to update this value once and it'll update everywhere that your program is. So naming standards, constants are always in all caps. Python doesn't have something called a, Python doesn't actually have a constant type. So what a constant type is, is other programming languages allow you to define a constant that it's not possible to change the value of. In Python, you can change the value of this in your code. That's valid. It's not going to give you an error. So that's why you give it an all caps so that people using your code know that this value shouldn't be changed. Uh, there are other ways of hiding things using underscores, but I'm not going to cover that. Uh, that's more for when you're creating more complicated uh, code than what we're doing at the moment. So once we've defined our constants, you then have all your function definitions. So define your function. Function doc strings is the same as your other doc string, except this basically will say what argument, what this function does, what arguments it should get, and what the return value. So I should have put a link in yet that gives you examples for doc strings. Uh, look it up. And there are lots of styles for doing this. Uh, Google has a style. Sphinx, which is a program that makes your document as a style. So find one that you like and use that. Uh, something else is generally don't define functions within other functions. There are cases where you'd want to do this, but read up that you do it correctly. It's not always the best to, case to have nested function definitions. The, the next block you're going to have is freestanding code. Uh, this should be avoided because when you import a package, all of these lines are executed. So your freestanding code will be run when you import the package, which is generally not a good idea. So instead of having freestanding code, wrap this in a function and then use this if statement to call that code. So what this does is it looks to see whether this, fun this 
file is being imported or whether it's being executed. So if we run python script name.py to run the script, this will return true and whatever's in here will be executed. On the other hand, if we are in another file and we say import script name, this will return false and this won't be executed. So what this lets you do is you can run files independently from the package and test them uh, or else use this to help create the files so that you don't need to run through all the other files to get you. You can just run the file as a standalone file. Um, so instead of having freestanding code, yeah, you would define, often it's called main, and you would then just call the main function in yeah. So if this is executed, it will then run this main function. Otherwise, if it's imported, it'll ignore your main function and you can just use the other functionality. Okay, so finally, command line arguments. Uh, command line arguments are used a lot in programs, especially when you're working from the terminal. So this is a way that you can give input to your programs. It is a very common method of giving input to your program. Up until now, we've used the input method in Python. This is virtually never going to be used in a production program. So they're not very useful because if you have intense calculations and after an hour, it's gonna pause the program and ask you for input, this isn't great because the person has to sit there the whole time checking to see if they need to put in, in give input. A much better option is to give command line arguments at the start of your program that sets all the variables that the user can configure. So we've already used some of these in other programs. So an example is when we use git add with a dot, add is a sub command and dot is a, so add and dot are both command line arguments. Uh, something else is, uh, I've got more examples later on, but anyway, this is git add and dot are command line arguments for the git function. So at the most basic level, and this is all I'm gonna go into in this class, is we can use the sys package and the argv variable to get our command line arguments. If you wanna make more advanced command line um, passes, there's a package called argpass with the other, I've got a link in the documents on the OneDrive. Um, read this, the examples are great and they go into a lot of detail in how to set this up and they give good examples. So you can pretty much copy paste their code and update it to do what you need it to do. So this gives you options like setting default values and limiting the values that can be input and setting up flags, which I'm gonna discuss in the next slide. So sys.argv can't really handle flags, whereas argpass is, handles flags easily. So let's carry on. There are two different types of command line arguments. Uh, the first is positional, and these are always going to be the leftmost arguments. And the other type are flag-based, or actually this doesn't necessarily need to be the leftmost. Uh, the other type are flag-based, and what these do is they require you to specify a flag. So positional arguments don't need any flag, and you just list them as the command line argument. So in this case, we could have git add and a list of files, which are just space separated. And using argv, this is going to work perfectly. An example of that can be seen here. So in our file, we just import sys. We then print system.argv. And this is going to print all our command line arguments. So something worth noting at this point is that the file name is the first command line argument. So yeah, we're calling the function. The file name is our first command line argument. A will be then our second, B will be the third, one will be the fourth, and so on. And something else is that these are always gonna be strings. If you use argpass, you can tell argpass the types and it will automatically convert these to be the correct types. Uh, so using flag-based arguments, this is basically, you give it a flag to specify what argument you're providing. So when we've done git commit, dash M is a flag to say that we want to leave a message. And then the next item after M is the value for this flag. This is not always the case though. So another example, we've done ls dash L. 
dash L doesn't need an argument. It's like a true or false value. So if it's there, it sets dash L to true. Otherwise it sets to false. So when you start making more advanced command line interfaces, you would want to most definitely use argpass and not use sys.argv. I'm just using this for example purposes. It's definitely worth your while to learn how to use argpass. It makes your programs much easier to use because you can have documentation and help and all sorts of things built into your program. All right, so for today's class, I was thinking of something to do and generally I'm way too ambitious and I don't get to finish. So today I am just gonna make a program that does so get some statistics from a body of text. Uh, I just use this because I've used it in the past. So this is the book Alice in Wonderland. It is in the lecture eight data folder. So we'll just make a new folder and copy this across. Uh, we're then going to use command line arguments to pass which file we would like to process. And then we can just get some statistics. And I just made these up. I don't even know if they're worth gathering. So some functions would be to get how many lines are in the file, how many words, how many characters, to calculate the word frequencies, to calculate the length of all the words. And this is to find words that commonly occur together. So yeah, I thought those would be a good place to start. And this is a nice example because we can split this up into separate files. So one file to handle command line, one file to handle the data processing, one file to handle calculating frequencies and things like that. So, any questions before we get started with this? Um, okay, I'll go have a look at that now. So, this I just wanted to say, like, I'm not, I'm just doing this from the top of my head. There are algorithms for string processing, and there are many of them. So, this is going, this won't be the best case. Like, the run times of this aren't going to be performance and things. But these string processing algorithms get fairly complicated, fairly quickly. So always try to start with the, get it working before you worry about making it run really fast. Okay, so if we look in lecture eight, not the old lecture eight, just in lecture eight, um, then there's a data folder and there's this Alice in Wonderland.txt. So it's not the old one. Um, and then we have lecture nine. Uh, Let's rename lecture nine. Okay, so before we even start any of this, let's set up our Git for this lecture. Uh, do we even, I don't even think we need to do that. So let's not even worry about doing that. So what we could have done in that case is gone to our source control and click this tick to commit any changes. I don't have any changes. And we could then have, uh, once we've, made our commits, we can change the branch. So if we click here where it says lecture, I'm on lecture seven, I don't think I got lecture eight, we can create a new branch called lecture forward slash 09. And we will now be on the lecture nine branch. But this doesn't really matter at this stage because um, we can just commit next time you need to do a git pull. For now we don't need to do that. And what we can change now is we can rename the lecture nine folder to lecture 9 2019 and make a new folder called lecture 9 and get the level right. Okay, and in this we will make a new folder called data and we will then copy uh, Uh, lecture eight, data, Alice in Wonderland. We can just copy this and paste it into this directory. And then in lecture nine, something you'll notice is that when they're nested folders that don't have content, VS Code will automatically combine those paths together. So if we wanted to add something to lecture nine, we can just right click on lecture nine and go new file and we can just call this uh, cli.py. That is, oh, okay. Um, so the reason that your lecture, okay. 
check old lecture. Okay, just go to old lecture A. Oh, that doesn't have it. Okay, so what you might need to do is swap to the lecture seven branch. Otherwise, we can just go download. Uh, I'll just go get the link to Alice in Wonderland. Uh, okay. All right. So, uh, okay. So, what happens is if you're on the lecture seven branch, so the lecture eight branch got updated in the last lecture, so it won't have those anymore. But if you're on lecture seven, it'll work. Otherwise, you can just copy and paste the text from that link and paste it into a new file, which will give you the same text. Uh, so, okay, let's, I'll wait here yeah, for a few minutes. Let me just go back to my lecture, go to my CLI. Okay, so I'll wait for a few minutes until everyone's kind of got the setup. While we wait, does anyone have any questions? Uh, are you on Windows or Mac? Um, PowerShell would be my recommendation. Uh, how do you make a folder? Uh, so there are different ways of making a folder. The one is you can click on this button over here to create a new folder. The other is if you right click on a directory, there's an option for new folder. Oh, okay. Yeah, oh, that's good to know. So you can import earlier when I said I don't know how to rename, you can rename things. You just need to specify them. So we could go from package, uh, package, import A as B, C as D. So you can name each of these individually when you're importing them together as a group. Something else you can do on Windows, but it might not work so well, is as your default shell, you can set that as the git bash shell, which will be more like using Linux, but you might get other issues by doing that. PowerShell would definitely be my recommendation. Okay, so something else we want to do is just open the terminal. Um, so control backtick to open that. And once this is open, we can activate our environment. So conda activate ITP 2020. Hopefully you've all created this environment by now. So this is just gonna activate our ITP 2020 environment. Yours will probably be on the left of the uh, input line or I don't even know what that's called actually. It'll just be on the left here. And Something else we can do is just CD into lecture 09. Uh, okay, so now we're in the correct lecture. Um, okay, so now that we're in that lecture, uh, in the lecture 9 directory, we can just type ls to see. So I think LS works on Windows and Mac. I mean, it definitely works on Mac. I think it'll work on Windows. So this just tells us that we've got a CLI.py file and we've got a data file, um, data folder with our project. Um, okay, so now that we've done that, let's get started. So the first thing we're gonna do is just set up our command line interface. So before we even do anything fancy, let's just import this and go print um, sys.argv. 
Okay, so all this is doing is it's just importing the sys package and we are printing the argv variable. So now that we've done that, we can then go Python to execute our program and then give it uh, the script name, so cli.py, and then some command line arguments. And nothing happens, so I'm assuming that uh, let me hide this. Uh, okay. Okay, uh, I'm assuming that it's because I didn't save my file. Yeah, exactly. So that's why I just, I've got the Zoom meeting control. So when you have this little dot at the top here, it means your file's not saved. So Command S or Control S to save it. Uh, we run it again. And there we now, when it gets to this line, it's going to print all the command line arguments. So if we run the script again, and we don't provide any command line arguments, and we run it, we now just get cli.py because the file name is always the first argument. So what's a common practice when working with this is to just go from the, to index this from the first onwards. So this is just going to ignore the file name and use the rest of the command line arguments. So if we try running this again, if we now get an empty list. If we run it with A, B, C, and D, we now get this as A, B, C, and D. Uh, something else that you might want to set up while we're doing something like this is it's not always so useful to be running these programs from the terminal the whole time. So you can push F5 and this is going to bring up your debug configuration and we can tell this to run this as a Python file. And then this is just going to run it as a Python file without any command line arguments, but we can create what's called the launch.json file. Um, or a Python file, and then over here. So this is like specific for VS Code. I think we can add args and then a list of our arguments. So a, comma b, comma c. So the way we can get you as well is F1 will bring up your command palette. Otherwise, you can click here and go uh, there and go command palette. Otherwise, you can do Command Shift T on a Mac or Control Shift T on Windows. Otherwise, there's another option at the top menu. And once we're in here, we can type launch.json and you can click on that and it'll open this. So in this case, our file is a Python file. It's not a module. So we want to create just a Python file. And now, let me hide these again. When we're on this current file, if we push F5 again, it will run our program using those command line arguments that we specified in the launch.json uh, file. An JSON file is just like a Python dictionary. So you have keys and values and these can be nested. So these are just set by the VS code. So this is just the name of what we want to call this configuration, the type. So this is the Python script. It should launch. I don't know what this means exactly. Uh, the program is looking at the file name probably, uh, which console. So we want to run this in the terminal that comes with VS Code. And then args is a comma separated list of all our arguments. So at this stage, we can change our args um, to be our file name. So uh, let's go here and we can go dot forward slash lecture 09 forward slash data forward slash uh, Alice let me go see what this is called so something else is when this launches the root directory for your arguments and things is always going to be the outermost level of your project so it won't run the file as if it's running from lecture 9 it's going to be running your relative farthing is going to be from this outer level. So we want lecture nine, data, Alice in Wonderland. Instead of typing this out, you can also right click on the file name and say copy relative path. And then that will actually give you the correct relative path to use. So this is the path to our text file. And uh, 
my R's weren't actually changing. So it's showing us a different color. Ooh, that is hard to debug. Um, have you got a comma at the end of this list over here, at the end of the previous line? So you have to comma separate each line of this. And if you're missing that comma, you'll probably get an error like that. Uh, okay. So now that we've got our arguments, we can either run this program from the terminal. So cli.py, uh, am I in? I don't think I'm in the right directory anymore. So oh, I've got two different shells now. So either I can run this as Python cli.py with some arguments, or I can, when I'm on this file, I can press F5 and it will, VS Code will handle running this. So you see now I'm getting the path to our data file as my command line argument. So something else I said earlier, it's bad to have freestanding uh, code. So if you just type main, it'll give you this option here that you can click on and that'll automatically expand out to our if name and main function. And then we can make a main function and wrap this um, in that function. So we can go file path as our argument and over here, instead of doing this there, okay, I'm gonna code this and then I will tell you what I've done after I've finished typing. So actually I don't even wanna do that. So let's go args is equal to our arguments. We then go if length uh, of our args is equal to one. So if we've only got one item in our arguments, we pass args one. Other, otherwise, we just don't do, uh, we can go else, uh, print too many args. So what we're doing here is we're firstly loading everything except the file name into an args variable. We then making sure that there is only one command line argument. And if there is, we're passing that argument to our main function. Otherwise, we're printing uh, too many slash few args um, should just be the file path. And over here, we can print uh, file path. So the benefit of doing it like this is if we are executing this using command line arguments, we first doing a little bit of error checking to make sure that we have the correct number of arguments. This isn't foolproof error checking. We might actually want to add something like making sure that the file that's specified in args exists as well and things like that. But at its most basic, this is just making sure that our program isn't going to break because people are giving too many arguments. So if we try run this, I'm just gonna run this using this code again. We have got CLI with two command line arguments. Uh, let me just save. So you see when I had two arguments, it's gonna tell me too many, too few arguments should just be the file path. If I run this with one argument, we're going to get an error. Um, oh, so this should be zero and not one because it's the first index when we skip the file name. And if we run this again now, we just print A. And on the same thing, if we run this as a debug mode using F5, it just prints the name of our text file. Okay, so this is basically going to function as our driver. So our, this main method is gonna control all the methods that our program is going to do. So the next thing that we might wanna do is create a new file um, in lecture nine and call this file handling uh, .py. And this file is gonna be in charge of doing all of our file operations. So we can make some functions in here. Uh, so let's go read complete file with a file path. So this function over here is going to be in charge of doing what the function name is. So we're gonna read the whole file using this function. So 
with open um, file path. Uh, oh, what have I done? Uh, as uh, FH. So if you use open without specifying how to open, it'll automatically default to read mode. So that's just a useful shortcut. Otherwise, you can specify R, um, but you don't need to do that. And then we can go return uh, fh.read. So this function is just going to take a file and return the contents of the file as, uh, well, basically text. So let's go see what this does. So let's go back to our CLI. I don't know if I saved or not, so I'm just going to save. And now what we can do is we can go from uh, file handling. So you'll see now this automatically gives me the completion for file handling. And then if I go import, and you can push control space to get a list, read complete file is the name of our function. So from file handling, we're importing that function we just defined. And now instead of printing the file path, we can print uh, read, complete file with the file path. So what this will do is when we start our program, it's gonna start in this block. It's first gonna get the arguments, make sure there's one argument. If there is one argument, it's gonna pass that to our main method function. And it's just gonna pass the file path to this function. We are then going to pass the file path to our reading function and that will read the file and return the result and we're gonna print that result. So this will get the file path, open it, read the contents and return them. So if we run this, uh, okay, I'm gonna run it using F5 now. And you can see now that it's printed out the entire contents of our file. So because we're running this in debug mode, we can also actually track the path that this takes. So if we put a break on this line by clicking over there, when we push F5 to run this, it's gonna to get to this line and it's gonna pause. On the left, it's gonna give us all of everything that's been defined already. So you can see when the script executed starts from the top and goes down. So we have a sys variable because that was imported. We then should have our read complete file because that was then imported. It then went on and it defined the main function, which is over here. It then went on and it got to this if statement, which doesn't actually define anything. And then we're currently on this line of code where we are getting the args. So at this point, if we look in sys, we can probably find the argv variable, which is here. So you can see this has got the two arg, uh, args that we have. But we haven't actually got this args variable because we're on this line, it still has to execute. So then in the top part of your screen, you've got all these different options. The first will continue until the next breakpoint. So because we don't have another breakpoint, this will just carry on the program and it'll, it'll finish without hitting another breakpoint. This will step over, so it will carry on to the next line of code, but it won't actually go into that line of code, which isn't something you necessarily want because if we go into a system method, it's gonna give us all the system code, which isn't necessarily useful. So that's what step into will do. Step out will step out of the current script that it's in. Um, play around with these, you'll get a, the hang of what they do. What I wanna do is just step over. So you see now we've gone to the next line of code and you can see now that we should have an args variable, which is a list that contains just the file name. So there's just a single entry. When we step over the next line, this the length of this was one because we only had the one item in it. So it goes to the main. So I think if I step over this now, it's just gonna end. Let's see what happens. So yeah, see when I step over, it stepped over this function. So it went to the next line, which passed and then the code just finished. If we run this again using F5, Instead of stepping over, I'm gonna step into. So this step into, if we click on that one, you'll see it's now stepped into our main function. And again, if I click this, it would finish the program. If we step into this, it now goes into this function and shows you that we're on this line. We can step over, 
And then if we step again, it takes us back to our main function. Uh, okay, file handling the py. Uh, hide that. There you go. Okay, so debugging is extremely useful. Um, something else that you can set up are watches. Uh, so you can actually type expressions into this. So we can say, let's watch the length of args. And you see, this will give the results of that expression that we've entered. You can also just put a value in here. So this will just return args. So this just gives you a way to track how values are changing as your programs go. Something else that you can do, which I haven't done in Visual Studio, is we can add a functional breakpoint. So we can break on args equal to zero. So I think this should work. I've never tried it. So basically, this will evaluate this expression. And if our args variable is ever zero, it'll break and stop the code from running. So these are useful if you say you run a program for an hour and it breaks, you want to figure out why, but you can't sit there clicking continue for an hour. You can give it a condition that should be met. So a certain error threshold or something, and then your program will stop running once that gets hit. So useful to know. Uh, we've got 20 minutes. That should be enough to get some things working at least. Okay, so let me just block out what we were planning on doing. So the one was number of lines in the file. Uh, then we wanted to do number of words and we wanted to do number of characters. So I mean, for now, let's see. 20 minutes, we should be able to do these three. If we have more time, we can do some more advanced things. So file handling is just in charge of handling our file. So this is the different ways that we can process our file. We'll make another file called something like stats. Um, stats.py. And I mean, these, this naming might not be great, but I'm just doing all this for example purposes. So let us see what we want to do. So let's define a function. Um, that is count number of lines, and this gets given some text. Okay, so to do this, we can just return uh, the length of text dot split on the new line. Okay, so I'm guessing this is going to work. I don't know whether it is. So this is a body of text and each character and each line ends with a new line character. So what we're doing is we're just splitting this on the new line into a list. This probably isn't the best way of doing this. We'll try it in two different ways. The other way we'll try is we will return um, text.count. I think there's a count method for text. Let's check. Uh, yeah, so there's a count method. So we'll do text.count the new line character. So generally, this is probably a better way of doing this because this actually is going to be more computationally intensive because it has to build a list and then take the length. But for testing purposes, let's see whether these two uh, return the same number. So back to our CLI. Um, so let's just go. Uh, data is equal to our read complete file. I'll go back to the other file after this. So firstly, we're saving the text into a variable called data. We then are going to need to import our method. So we'll go from stats, import uh, control space to get a list, count number of lines. And we will now uh, print Okay, let's save this into a variable. So we'll go numlines is equal to count number of lines with our data. Okay, so I'm not going to go over the full process again. We are starting in the main method. It's getting a path to a file. We are reading that file into a variable. So this will just contain the complete text that's in the file. We are then passing that text on to a uh, data there. Uh, we are then passing the text onto our count number of lines function, which at the moment 
I'm just going to save this. So at the moment, I got an error there. I'll go back and look at that now. Um, oh, so this isn't a package, which is why I'm not using source. I'm just importing files. So to make this a package is a bit more involved and I didn't really have time to set this up as a package. So in the last two lectures, we'll set things up as packages. Um, oh, so the reason I'm getting a warning here is this is if we go to problems, uh, this is going to give us all of our linting issues. So yeah, you can see we've got an unused variable. So if you make a variable and you don't use it, it gives you a warning saying that you should do something with it. So in our case, we're just going to print some lines. Um, so just importing from other scripts, you don't need to use relative parsing, and you can't actually use relative parsing if I'm not mistaken. So it'll look for a file in the directory uh, called a name and you can import functions from that. So we are then going to return the length of the text split on all the return lines. So let's run this. So in order to push F5 to run our program, we have to be on this script. If we were on the stat script and we tried to do that, it would try to run this, uh, it'll try to run the stats file, I think. Yeah, so nothing happened because it's running stats.py uh, instead of our cli.py. So later on when we set up a module, it'll bypass all this because we'll tell it exactly which file is the entry point. But for now, this just runs the file that we currently have open in the editor. Okay, so we run this. I'm just going to remove the break statement and continue. Uh, so this says there are 3,736 new lines in the file. Uh, how can we test that? Let's go and open the file and scroll to the bottom. So 3,736, so that looks right. Uh, let's try the other method. So now let's do this. So instead, we're going to count the number of new lines and go to CLI. So, oh, one less. Ah, okay. So the reason we're getting one less is because the last line in the file probably doesn't end in a new line. So in a case like this, where we know that we're one short of the number of lines, uh, we can just add one to the end to offset and that'll give us the correct offset. Okay, so that's the number of lines in the file. The next thing we might want to count is the number of words in the file. Anyone have any ideas how we would do that? Split on space. WC-L is, yeah, I mean, when you're not using Python, that's a valid way of doing it in the command line. Um, but splitting on the, what's it called? Sorry, let me write that. Uh, splitting on the space is a great way of doing this. We are going to get some issues with that because there might be blank lines and things like that, but we will start by doing this. And instead of counting the number of words, like let's just make a function called split on space so we can see what the output is. Uh, Oh wait, we're counting the number of words. Okay, yeah, so let's just do this in the raw sense first. Okay, so return the length of our text dot split on the space. Okay, so that's a good place to start. Let's start with that and see what happens. So now we've got a new function, so we need to import it first. So count number of words. And then we can print number of lines and we can make a new variable called num words is equal to count number of words with our data and then print num words. Okay. So we've got our function, it's defined correctly. Uh, we've got this, let's run it. So we get 27,968. Uh, so I don't know if that's correct or not. So let's actually, instead of just counting the raw number, let's get the number of times each word occurs in the file. 
So the way we can do that is using a default dict. So once again, when you're doing your imports, you import what this file needs. So we need a default dict in this file. So we don't need to import it in our CLI file. We import it in the file that requires it. So from collections, import default dict. Uh, okay, and then instead of doing it this way, let's go uh, count, word counts is equal to default dict int. So this, we've gone over this in the previous lecture, but a default dict will just initialize a value. So in our case, we want counts. So the value is gonna be an integer and it's gonna start at zero if it doesn't exist. So now that we've got our word counts, we can go for uh, word in text dot split on the space word counts, uh, word plus equals to one. And we can then return word counts. So this is just gonna initialize a default dict to count each word. Uh, we then go through each word in our split text. We then look in the dictionary for that word and add one to it. So if it doesn't exist, it'll be set to zero and then have one added to it. If it does exist, we'll just add one to the existing count. And we can run this exactly the same. Uh, I should probably name, rename this file to get word counts. So let's do that actually as well. So uh, function name should be like explicit. So this should be get word counts and we'll add our other function back again. Uh, count number of words with text and then return length text dot split on the space. Okay, so we have our same function and then we've got uh, get word counts function. So we need to once again import that and we print the number of words uh, I've got a typo, thank you. Uh, there we go. Uh, okay, so get the number of words and then just go counts is equal to get word counts with text. And I'm not doing anything with that, so let's print count. Uh, okay, why am I getting this error? Oh, I think I was running using other shortcuts, so let's run it. F5 and we get an error, this should be data. So yeah, when you're in debug mode and you get an exception, it gives you this red box. Uh, to rerun, you can then just click this green circle in the top corner and it'll restart your script. And now we have got all of our word counts and I just wanted to see whether these are sorted. So just on the offhand looking here, you'll see one issue. So this issue is that line, words ending with new lines are treated as being a whole word. How can we fix something like this? And we're running out of time, so I'm just gonna go. So when we add the word here, um, we can, instead of just going this, strip will work in some case. Okay, so that's a good way to start. So strip will fix this, but strip only affects the ends of a word. So this one won't actually be fixed by strip because the new line's in the middle. So the way we can fix this is, let's just go like call this word group or something like that. And then we can go for word in word group dot split on the new line. We could also replace new line with spaces. That's another valid approach. Something else we could do is actually split this on the new lines before we do this. So that's actually a better approach than what I'm doing now. So I'm just gonna do that. So I'm just gonna go for line in text dot split on the new line. And then we're gonna go for word 
in a change line that splits and take that out and then up the count. Okay, splits without arguments, splits on all white spaces, tabs, and you like, oh, that's good to know. Okay, so there we go. Uh, I don't actually have to do this then. I can just do that and go forward. Okay, so now we are just splitting on all white spaces and counting the number of words. Save this, run this again. Have a look at what our output is. Uh, just running. Okay, so now we look at the output and we've still got some cases with brackets that don't really work, but I don't have time to fix those sorts of issues. So let's not worry about that. But overall, this is all working fairly smoothly. The next thing that you might want to do is over here, you've got a capitalized word. So you might want to drop everything to lowercase so that capitals aren't treated separately. You might also want to strip out all punctuation marks. So these are all just things that you can think of while doing something like this. And the last thing I'm going to do, because yeah, I mean, as I've said, we always run out of time when doing this, is basically let's get the top word. Um, so the top 10 words. So let's make another function called get top words. And this takes, gets word, uh, a word count dict as input. Okay, so the way we can do this, uh, let's make this like slightly fancier. Let's say n is equal to 10. Okay, so we're gonna by default get the top 10 words, but otherwise we can always change this later on to make it get different numbers of words. So I think there are better ways of doing this now in the new version of Python, but I don't know them yet. So I'm just going to do it using the way I know is we are going to sort the word count dict. So sorted actually works on lists. It doesn't work on dictionaries. So what we're going to do is we're going to give word count dicts.items to get a tuple containing the keys and values. And then we are going to give a key to the sorted and we are going to provide what's called an unnamed function, which is going to be covered in the next lecture. Um, so this we can then say key and count. Uh, key looks like it's a key. I'm just going to say K and count. Uh, it actually wasn't a keyword. Okay, so this is going to unpack each of these items into K and count. Lambda is just the same as running a function, except it always just has to return something. So the key is what should we sort on? So we're going to sort this on the count. So this is going to unpack these items into a K and a count, and it's going to use the count value to sort our list. And then if you had ties, you could actually return a tuple. And so sort by the count if they're ties sorted alphabetically using the key. And then from this list, we would like to return um, the top n. Let's see if this works. Might not. Okay. Um, ooh. What's this from? Stats. Uh, okay. So getting an error yeah on this means that there's a syntax error in this file. Okay. So when you get an error like this and it's pointing to an import at the top, it generally means you've got something wrong in this file that's being imported. That is the case here. Let me just see what the problem is. Uh, positional argument follows keyword argument. Uh, uh, I think we just might need to bracket this. Let's see if that helps. Okay, so you just needed to package this as a tuple instead of just separating it by a comma. And Let's see if this works. So we restart. And I'm not actually running that function. So it's not really going to do anything. So let's import uh, get top words and run that on cuts. Okay. So you'll see I use black, so it automatically split this into new lines. Uh, 
and we get an error. Okay, missing one positional argument count. Okay, let's take this out for now. Uh, lambda. Okay, and instead of doing this, I'm just going to go x and then return x1 and x0. So instead of trying to unpack this into two values, I'm just going to leave it as being a tuple and then flip them around and return a new tuple and see if that works. Uh, so let's restart. Okay, so that worked. And now we have got all the counts and you'll see that this is in ascending order. So the is the most common word, which is to be expected. And is the next most common word. Two is the next most common word and so on of A. So yeah, I mean, basically let's add this last feature with N. Uh, so to do that, we'll just go subset the list and only return the first N items. And let's see if that works. So now, by not telling it how many items to return, it'll use the default value of 10. But say we only wanted the top five, we could then specify five over here. And then if we run this again, instead of giving the top 10 items, we now just get, well, okay, this is the wrong way around, so we're getting the bottom. Uh, we can change this to reverse. So this will just reverse the list. So it'll be in descending order instead of ascending order. And let's run that. So this gives us the top five. And if we take this five out and run it, it's going to give us the top 10. But I think that's a good place to stop. I'm sorry, I didn't get to any more advanced things. Uh, least frequency one. Um, so, okay, you wanted the least frequent. Uh, so the first thing I'll do is clean up the data, but because a lot of the least frequent words are going to be things that like it's capitalized and stuff like that. Um, let's change this back to false and run it and just actually look at some of the, so you'll see like, this backslash is, might be causing some issues with this word. So you'd want to clean up those things. So this has got a double dash to it. So that's why this has got a quotation mark. This has got a quotation mark, quotation mark, quotation mark. So those things are causing the counts to be quite low. Um, I would first go and strip all of these quotes out. And yeah, I mean, once you've got the least frequent you can rank them alphabetically, which is what I did yeah, by saying the second value. But say now you wanted to rank them on the length of the word. Instead of doing that, we could rank on the length of X. So this will first sort by the count and then it will sort by the length of that um, item. So if we run this, it now, ah, uh, uh, no, it is working. So these are the shortest words which are coming first. So O, for I, and things like that. So yeah, there are lots of ways that you can do the sorting and it depends on the case as to how you'd want to go about doing that. Uh, I'm just gonna stop the lecture for now. Um, I thought I would be able to 